Hello everybody, Scott Golden here with the Pro Wrestling Logic YouTube channel. Welcome to those of you who are new. Welcome back to those of you who are seasoned veterans of what we do around here. We cover both modern day and um, old school pro wrestling, focusing mainly on the old school aspect. Uh, this is the World Class Championship Wrestling Review Series. It is uh, currently at the end of June for 1982. This specific uh, installment is the June 26th, 1982 episode. So we're entering the second half of the year. Please like, subscribe, comment below if you like this content. And also, I want to thank everybody for uh, helping with the growth of the channel. We're not getting as many subscribers as, as I'd like, so I would appreciate it if you could uh, share these audios if you like them on social media so we can get the subscriber count up. What's amazing to me is we have literally three times the watch hours that we need to uh, uh, monetize and grow the channel, which I want to do some really cool things for charity with, but we need the subscribers, so if you could help with that, that would be awesome. Anyway, uh, we we move into the review. Captain Frank Dusick versus Brian Adidas. Uh, Adidas, I think this is his first match, and he's primarily in the world-class territory for a good number of years. Um, he actually is pretty well pushed here, which I didn't realize my exposure to him is more late 80s 86 87 that time frame and by this point he's an enhancement talent he doesn't seem to be that here captain frank dusick is a mainstay at this time kind of seems like the guy they test new talent out with in a lot of ways uh very basic match you know uh headlock takeovers and and arm bars and the like uh really simple adidas looks credible for the most part um and obviously, Dusik uses the opportunity to cheat whenever he can find it. Um, they go almost all the way through. Notable spots as I, as I run through, not really that many of them. I will say that the getting the most out of holds is something that Dusik is really good at. If you're a prospective independent wrestler or anything like that, kind of looking at that and, and seeing how to get, you know, Four minutes out of a headlock. Not that we'd even be allowed to do that anymore, but I, I, I do believe that everything that's old will become new again. So at some level, I think there's a value to the idea of maybe looking at that as, as a concept that sometime maybe the holds that are used will change. But the idea of uh, holds being central focus may become uh, new again in the next 10, 15 years. Uh, they go to a time limit draw here, um, and uh, uh, Adidas is asking for five more minutes, which uh, Dusik does not grant. Um, as mentioned, there's a really good drop kick by Adidas here. Um, for the most part, a good television debut. Uh, we move on to the next match, which is Ra Raul Castro against Magic Dragon. I don't know if this is the first time we've seen uh, a mask versus mask style match, meaning two guys in masks, not that one of them is going to lose it. Uh, obviously, Magic Dragon out with Arman Hussein, representing Hart, Hart and Hussein Unlimited. Uh, um, as is to be expected, this is a primarily squash match, although um, Raul does get a good bit of offense. Um, match is... Innovative for its time in a lot of ways, um, in the sense of just a lot, a lot of strike-related stuff, a lot of um, you know back and forth, nerve holes, the backflip from Dragon, things that we've all seen before. But for let's suppose there's a new fan out there or someone who's flipping channels in 1982, this is much much different than the average wrestling match in terms of a more martial arts presentation. Obviously, today, it would be seen as, like, amateur or, you know, somewhat somewhat tame. But back then, this was cutting-edge offense. Um, a lot of different speed uh, aspects. The backflip from Dragon, which is part of every match. The strikes that look like they were knockout strikes in terms of kicks. The prominence of holds and, and even you know just looking at something as simple as an easy nip up from 
uh, Ma- uh, Magic Dragon is is a big thing. And then the the reverse head scissors, uh, a la Choke, is a big thing here too. He does win with this particular maneuver. We move on to Kevin Von Erich versus Arman Hussein. Uh, Von Erich does uh, wrestle barefoot, I think, from here forward for the most part. Um, uh, obviously, he did an interview a few weeks back regarding the barefoot thing being just something that's more comfortable for him. So that's a little interesting to me. Um, and as we move into kind of an age where the Von Erichs are, not that they were in prominent, but I mean, they're basically going to be the force for the next several years in this promotion. Um, Ke- Kevin is kind of the, the, unsung hero of the family in a lot of ways the only von eric that is still alive uh, all the rest either losing their life to battles with drugs or unfortunate medical circumstances or suicide so it's just a really sad family story i think dark side of the ring did a did a series on the von erics i could be wrong on that but uh, as far as the match is concerned relatively basic but the one thing that i that i who am, i'm going through this iteration of world class for the first time episodically um i think kevin was a better striker than he was given credit for uh king kong bundy does make his way out to help his manager slash uh fellow heart hussein teammate uh bundy does a good bit of damage to um von eric and and I think through the end of Bundy's involvement with the promotion, which I think he goes to Mid-South for a while in 83 or 84 before going to the World Wrestling Federation in 85, right around uh, WrestleMania one time. I'm pretty sure that he goes. But there is, you know, Von Eric with the claw. The claw becomes a major issue for, um, you know, Bundy. And and Bundy just kind of, it's interesting. He walks to the ring. He slaps Kevin in the head. And even something as simple as a slap to the head from a guy Bundy's size is a big deal. Um, and then Kevin drop kicks uh, uh, Hussein into Bundy, gets the pinfall, and then Bundy and Hussein beat him down for uh, several minutes. One thing I like about this is that each member of Hart and Hussein International seem to have defined roles. I think one thing that's missing in wrestling today is to find roles for faction members. Um, Bundy is your heavy hitter. Uh, Magic Dragon is a guy who, you know, is to be respected and, and feared. Kabuki's the guy that takes some of the losses, but there's still mystery to him. I, like, every guy, I think, has value, and I think is cer- certainly looking at something like the Dark Order or this new Retribution thing, who, outside of Brody Lee being the leader of Dark Order, who matters in in those scenarios? Anyway, uh, they're hyping the coming of a new talent in the weeks to come uh, in an interview with Bugsy McGraw. McGraw is frustrated with Armand Hussein because Hussein is talking about bringing in a fellow African-American wrestler and seems to be pushing Bugsy to the side. This is the beginning uh, (coughs) of the... Uh, babyface turn for Bugsy, which I'm kind of confused because we don't have the leverage of, of footage from 1981, but Bugsy seems to be babyface for a little bit there, or at least more towards the babyface side, and then does a turn to join Hussein and Hart uh, Limited, and then turns back, all that in less than a year, so uh, rapid turns seems to be a big deal. Then we go to an interview with Kerry Von Erich. Uh, he's in the gym. He looks like a million bucks, whether it's artificial or legitimate, who knows, but he looks like a guy who's a world beater, and he's talking about being ready for Ric Flair. He, right here, he's about six or so weeks away from uh, a mid-August match with Flair, and at the time, I can imagine... Every fan who has been a long-term fan is looking at this as their hometown hero going to make good. Uh, Brian Adidas is, is also in the gym. Training partner with Kerry Von Erich talks about 
getting a future, talks about wanting to be like the Von Erics. It's an easy rub, and I, I think that's, that's missed, too, in today's wrestling of, like, if you don't have main eventers with credibility, it's hard to give a newer guy a rub when you want to bring him in, and I think that's, that's a missing factor. Like, yeah, Drew McIntyre might be able to convince you to care about a guy, but it would be much harder than, say, a Kerry Von Erich who's been over for two years endorsing someone new. Uh, we go to the next match, the next match being a great Kabuki match against Sal, Sal or Oliveira. Um, enhancement match, as is to be expected here. Um, for some reason, it's funny, the, the order of events is out of sequence on the network, so the segments are not lined up properly. You kind of have to go backwards and forwards to get them, so I don't know who put this particular episode together, but they might have been uh, in <laughs> in an interesting state of being when they did. Anyway, um, we we go through this match. It's it is to be it is what's expected here. Um, rather one sided Kabuki with strikes and nerve holds. Nothing really to write home about here. Amazing to me that Kabuki has taken, and this is this is something else that um, WWE is missing. Kabuki with a fist drop, by the way, to get the victory. But WWE and and to a lesser extent other independent promotions are missing the ability to get heels over to the point where when they take losses, it doesn't affect their credibility. Um, now it's like everybody is even, so to speak, and it just it doesn't come off the same. Uh, we move on to the main event, Wild Bill Irwin and Al Madrill in a non-title match for the Texas Championship. Um, Madrill, again, is a guy that I don't particularly like, but the fans do, so this would be one of those cases where if I'm the booker, I'm actually, and I, and I will admit this, in my mind as a booker, uh, I would be inclined to have other people book the people I didn't like because, or didn't see anything in because if, if the fans are buying it, and I'm, I'm poor at booking this particular individual or group of individuals. That's on me because I'm costing myself money. So I think one thing that's important is if the fans are buying someone and you don't know how to book them, admitting you don't know how to book them is a, is a valuable tool and going, you know what, we're going to have people that book specific people I don't get as a promoter. Um, I think that's a better way. Obviously, this match is very back and forth. They have a, I wouldn't say a long history, but certainly a history of going to battle with each other. Um, uh, you know, Irwin takes it to Madrill, but Madrill took the majority of the match. He does, uh, Irwin uses a stun gun, among other things, to keep his opponent at bay. Uh, uses the particular uh, slam that he generally does, unfortunately for him. This does not work. Uh, Madrill eventually does take the victory. He takes the victory with a, um, let, let me just find it here. Um, he takes the victory with a kind of a, a slip over victory, for lack of a better term. Um, he's, he's fired up on him, and it's, it's amazing because when uh, Bill Irwin sells, he's so exaggerated with his selling that, that, he he doesn't have to go down. It's just his facials and with the hair and everything. He's he's really excited. You can see it, and the crowd buys it. So he's not taking a whole world of bumps, but he is able to through facial expression um, convey you know urgency and whatever. They do a double down uh, near the end of the match, and I mean they got probably twelve ish minutes, uh, and it 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 plays out well for them. But a uh, drop kick by uh, Madrill, and then they go out to the floor, which it's interesting to me that they go out to the floor but don't use weapons. I mean, brawling on the floor is, is a legitimate thing back here at this time. Uh, Madrill gets him back in the ring and uh, spends a little bit of time, probably about 30 seconds, continuing his offensive assault before taking the victory. It's also interesting to me that, you know, now you take Madrill to the interview and he's talking about being Texas champion three or four or so many times doing it for the people. I don't, 
that that is one challenge with Almadril. I don't find him to be a guy who, when he talks about being a fan favorite, is believable. But the fans at the time do. Um, they do a shoulder tackle spot, and Madrill just falls forward on top of him. That can be used as a fluke win. And again, fluke wins are awesome when they're done right. As in, um, you know, uh, Irwin can come back and say something like, well, he hit me with a shoulder tackle, but we bumped heads, and I had a momentary concussion, and I couldn't defend myself, and he took advantage of me, so I didn't really lose. There's a way for Heal to come back from that type of finish, and, you know, that's there, but... That will close out the month of June in 1982. We'll go into the second half of the year with our with our next uh, experience, and hopefully uh, it is uh, enjoyable for you. But once again, keep your feet on the ground, your mind in the moment. Till next time, everybody.